Hey, welcome everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in the studio, in our Palo Alto studio, uh, for a little conversation, bring you up to date with uh, a special guest. We're excited to have Marie Hattar, the CMO of Ixia in the studio. Welcome. Thanks, it's great to be here. Absolutely, so for the folks that aren't familiar with Ixia, give us kind of the, uh, the overview. Sure, Ixia is a mid-sized company uh, that focuses on three areas. One is test, and probably most of our audience would be familiar with us. We develop uh, test equipment that uh, pretty much most of the major uh, network equi equipment manufacturers use to ensure their products run exactly as they want them to. Uh, the other side of our business is more focused on the IT side, and that's we have an extensive uh, network visibility as well as security portfolio. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, we help support uh, organizations through their full life cycle of IT, all the way from test till they move it to production. So, is, are your customers like the manufacturers of this type of equipment, or really the the implementers of this type of? Both, equipment? actually, we have uh, we we are used by the top fifteen of. Uh, the top 15 network equipment manufacturers, you name it. Uh, they use us, whether you're a security vendor, a networking vendor, you use our stuff uh, to test uh, their, their gear to make sure their routers, switches, firewalls work exactly as you would expect them to. But that's the, I'll call it the pre-production side of it when you're trying to get uh, things out of the lab into selling it to service providers and enterprises. Service providers and enterprises actually use our stuff before they deploy it in live production, and then they use our uh, our equipment in live production, more from an IT side to make sure the operations are as you expect, making sure application performance is working properly, network performance, their firewalls uh, are getting the right data distributed to them. So a lot of our visibility portfolio, what it does is uh, it's a very intelligent data distribution mechanism. Okay. It makes sure it redirects uh, a lot of the information that you get from your network. So if you think about it, you got your traffic going through your network and you want to make sure it's operating and there is no bottlenecks, there's no blind spots. Now, typically what people do is uh, they, sometimes some of them will use their switching gear, like a typical, say, Cisco switch, and they'll use this concept called span ports, which really mirrors the traffic and sends it off to some sort of tool, you know, you name it, like a Splunk analytics tool or a Riverbed Performance Manager, Dynatrace, you name it. Uh, in addition to that, they typically, that same traffic, if it's coming in line, goes to your firewall, your IPS, before it actually enters your network. Uh, other vendors, because they want to get data from multiple points, not just from where the switch is, they use technology called TAPS, where they pretty much tap into the data and it mirrors it and will allow you to scale it to send it to more tools. So we sell a portfolio of TAPS, but then we also sell a portfolio of bypass switches and, uh, and a third piece of it, which is really the intelligence piece of it, what is called in the industry network packet brokers. And what that does is it amalgamates all that data that you're getting from the taps. If you think about it, you know you could be tapping into so many segments of your network, and uh, when that happens, you've got a lot of replicated data because you know the same traffic may be crossing multiple points. So before you send it to a performance management tool, you kind of want to clean it up, and that's really what our product does. It's intelligent. It knows which tool needs what set of data, cleans it up, deduplicates it. Uh, if, uh, if, for example, this day and age, a lot of traffic is SSL encrypted for security, well, that's good and bad because, uh, you know, if it's your stuff and you know it's really clean, that's okay, but malware could be hiding there. So you want your tools to actually be able to inspect that and make sure it's not bringing in malware into your environment. So that's really our visibility portfolio. And beyond that, we also have, uh, uh, we've introduced in the last year, a new product uh, that we call a threat intelligence gateway. And what it is, is it's really a security tool booster, for lack of a better word. Uh, I like to use the analogy, I don't know, like at home, how much junk mail, not, not your email, just <laughs> junk mail. How much junk mail Luckily do you get? less than it used to be, that's a good thing. Well, I don't know about you, but like for me, I, I go home and I literally open my, like, my mailbox and there's usually about this much of mail, of which probably about this much is junk mail. So I pull it out and I sit there and I go on my counter and it's like junk, 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 
I don't know if this is junk or not because it looks legitimate, but it could be hokey. Oh, this is from my mother. You know, I recognize her writing. This is legitimate. Well, in many ways, our threat intelligence gateway does that same functionality. What it does is it pulls out all the junk traffic off your network. So if there's geos, you don't want to, you know, you, let's say here in the cube, you have no business with Afghanistan. You can completely block off anybody trying to send you traffic from Afghanistan. So uh, there's by location you can block things out by by you know specific segments, etc. So what it does is it really makes sure whatever is used, like your firewall, your IPS, is really getting the traffic that you're not sure about, as opposed to having to waste cycles on things that you know is junk. Right, right. So that's our portfolio. So you're right in the middle of all kinds of big transformations that are going on. We are. <laughs> we, 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 we get in the front, like for a lot of the innovations of technology, because they're trying to, we actually have to outpace in some ways the innovations, because our test gear is testing these new innovations. Right, right, so. Right. You know, it's not like we wait for it to happen. We actually have to, we're almost always on the leading edge of any new standard that comes out, any any shift that happens so that we are designing the equipment to make sure as you bring that to market, it works. So let's talk about a few specific ones. So software sure. defined, right? A, a big um, knock was always a vir virtualization getting into networking was the last, you know, storage virtualization, mm -hmm. server virtualization happened first, and then you had this big lag with kind of, network virtualization, but now everyone's talking about software-defined networking. How is that impacting your business, and how are you seeing that kind of play out within your customer base? Uh, so it is having an impact in that more and more people want uh, to test the functionality. So the big thing, depending on who you are, if you're a service provider and you're shifting more towards using SDN and NFV functionality, you want to make sure that as you migrate to that functionality that it works like it did in the physical world. Right. So you actually use our gear to make sure that the different services, the performance is not degrading as you shift to an SDN, NFV type of functionality. But beyond that, what's happening is you also, uh, the, the nature of the product is also shifting to be virtual. So it used to be that uh, our test products were just pure hardware oriented and we generate loads and that's how you test things. And you still need to do that when you're trying to generate like sort of a performance load. But if you're trying to do functionality testing, you know, making sure, you know, A goes to B and everything works properly, we've developed a whole slew of what we call virtual additions, which pretty much you can roll back and deploy software-wise anywhere in your network. So we're seeing a big shift happening where, especially on, I'd say on the testing side and, and also on, I would say in the production side, when you move to a virtual world that you need the tools, the agents, the capabilities to do everything virtually. Right, right. The other big trend obviously is cloud. Mm -hmm. And there's cloud, whether you're using a uh, you know, third party provider like AWS or Azure, um, and then, but also people want cloud-like functionality within their own data center or other service providers, basically kind of the, the on-demand capacity. Very different kind of, of um, infrastructure problem versus when you just are kind of over-provisioning, putting in what you need, and then as you get close to the uh, to the peak of what you've got in, you got to order more stuff. So as, as you see cloud mm -hmm. growing, and within your customer base and growth in the service provider business, how, how is that playing out for your customers? So so it's interesting. So I, again, I'll, I'll talk more about our visibility side because you know that's a usage standpoint. And what happens with... Uh, with cloud, let's break it into, I'll call it private cloud and public cloud, because hybrid is just a mix of two, which is right. basically what right. everybody uses. So private cloud, you pretty much own the infrastructure. So you can put in whatever equipment or gear you want into that. It's just what happens is it's virtualized. And you know a lot of the challenge has been it was seeing east-west traffic as it goes, you know, sort of inter-virtual machine. But, uh, but companies like Ixia and uh, we've developed that virtual tapping capability that we can actually put in our agent in those virtual machines, whether it's you know a Microsoft Hyper V or you know sort of VMware or you know you name it, where essentially it can go in there and can replicate and move that data, so you can actually see and monitor what's going on. Now, when it comes to the AWS sort of the, the Azure type environments, well, that's not your infrastructure anymore. Right, if you think right. about it, so so the way to address that is a very different type of solution because 
you, you can't force them to install your your software on there. You almost have to kind of create a capability sort of that's in some ways a, an agent oriented capability that you know an end vendor getting that uh, that that piece of AWS can implement to be able to monitor their data. And I'd say that's a huge problem today. Most people don't quite know what's going on in terms of that cloud infrastructure as it relates to their data. Everybody wants to use it. They love the economies of scale, the agility, but by the same token, the tools are not all quite there for them to have that same level of inspection as when they have it locally. Yeah. And so, so that's an area that you know we're working with. We're working with the AWSs, et cetera, to make sure that we are building that type of capability, so our customers can still have access to their data. Right, it's their data. It's their data. And the other huge trend, well, two of them in one, but we'll, I'm going to combine them is is mobile, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and video, and video on mobile. I mean, who, who would have thunk, right? Exactly. A couple of years ago, that that everyone would be watching. You know, an NFL game on their on their mobile device, or I don't even want to imagine what the network traffic percentage is when you know Game of Thrones season finale <laughs> comes up. On terms of the network, that's a very different demand on the network than you know kind of traditional data packets uh, that are, that are in a database. So from you know your kind of historical perspective, mm -hmm. how has that really impacted? you know, what the, the network providers are trying to do and the technology of networking itself. So, uh, as you know, I've been in the networking business, I would say now for, gosh, I'm going to age myself, uh, over 20 years. And, uh, and uh, you know, in the beginning, it was just like, it was really email transfers, nothing more, you know. So, like, it gets there, who cares? You know, if not, we'll retransmit, no right. big deal, time delayed, no issue. Uh, we, we moved to along to voice and to, to, to video. And video was not that terribly reliable initially. But now, I mean, you know, and any Friday night, everybody's on Netflix, uh, you name it. Uh, I'll tell you, my kids, I have two daughters, they are watching everything. We're in the car, they're constantly watching everything on their phone, right, full-fledged right. video. So what it's meant is that a lot of the infrastructure that was traditionally just, uh, if you want, um, non-mobile service provider infrastructure has had to move to new innovations, whether it's LTE, you know, there's a big shift now to 5G networks, uh, to support that bigger bandwidth and also to make sure that all the right compressions are happening on the video to provide as much of a real-time experience as possible. So it has changed, you know, the one thing when you talk to service providers, there's always going to be more, like, demand for more bandwidth. You right. know, it's never the case of it's going to be less bandwidth. Right. Right. So at one point it was like, you know, who would have thought you would have filled up an Ethernet cable? And now it's like, okay, you know, that's shifted off to 10 gig, 100 gig, you name it. The same thing is happening on mobile because none of us want to be tethered. And and you just have to look at how, you know, whether it's like the Snapchats. You, know, you, you mentioned video specifically, but for me, I, I always look at that next generation and what they're doing. And... You know, their whole life is now on that phone right, right. And, and how they're interacting, whether it's video or, you know, like my daughter sits there and Uvu's for, with five or six, seven people oh, at the... Uvu, I haven't heard of that one. Uvu, it's like, it's a multi-video multi conferencing. Okay. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, I'm used to the one-on-one -on -one FaceTime. Right, that, that's right, kind of my right. evolution. And she's like, yeah, mom, you're so passe. Like, that's not what we all use. You know, this is how we bring everybody on so we see everybody at the same same time. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And it's all mobile. It's all on their phones. Right, right. What's well, the other funny thing about mobile is is what really flipped the switch is, you know, the expectation of it's an application centric world. It's mm -hmm. DevOps, it's app developers, we gotta get stuff out fast, we gotta get things out. We can't worry about the infrastructure. A complete flip of the model where it used to be what's the infrastructure? Okay, can you build something that is supported by that? Now the expectation is the infrastructure has to support whatever I build, and oh, by the way, it has to be flexible, scalable, based on the cloud. So it's really kind of changed the hierarchy of what is driving the bus. Yeah, it has. I mean, in many ways, it really is changing the type of technologists people have. I mean, there's definitely a big shift 
more towards app developers, I would say, than, say, the pure hardware guys who are, you know, sort of developing a faster ASIC, a faster hardware board. Now, don't get me wrong, ultimately everything has to run on something right, physical, right. But, but at the end of the day, a lot of the innovation is happening more towards the application side. And, uh, and you're right, I think, I think the changes in technology, the evolution is such that it's assumed that that infrastructure is just there. It's just compute resources. So it's going to work. It doesn't matter what it is. And the assumption is it's an app world. People are driven by apps. And, uh, and the infrastructure will take care of itself. Um, you know, it, it, it's always cyclical, though. Like, that's the right, funny right. thing is, is if you look back on history, it's just it's always it's kind of like the, the model of centralized versus decentralized. I think hardware versus app centric right. has shifted. But we're definitely in that very app centric world uh, right now, you know, till, till we actually hit a limit from a hardware standpoint, and then that'll change. Right now, we're not hitting any limits right. on the hardware right. side, so we, we can afford to shift very much uh, towards applications. But it does create uh, an interesting dynamic for a lot of companies that are more, you know, sort of uh, have been very transitioned into, I would say, a more hardware-centric environment. I mean, even my previous company, uh, Cisco, you know, you listen to Chuck Robbins, and he's undergoing a whole transition where he's shifting his engineering base to be much more of a software-centric model. Right. Um, and and in many ways, you know, we have a bunch of uh, folks at Ixia, and, and uh, you know, some of them are like, yeah, like uh, we were talking about one of the, the events uh, that we're going to, and they're like, yeah, don't even think about taking, you know, any hardware there. Like, we're the cloud era. Like, like some of us who grew up there don't even want to see any hardware. We're just not interested. <laughs> They don't know that the cloud is somebody else's computer, right? Exactly. It does have to run somewhere. And then, and then the next whole generation that's coming down the pike, and I'm sure you're involved with it at Cisco, and we do a lot of stuff with GE, is the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, now if that network connection breaks down between, you know, the turbine or, or a factory or whatever, it's not like your daughter's not being able to get into the Uvu application. Now, there's right. some serious consequences, and networking is a big piece of that puzzle, especially when you have remote locations mm -hmm. and all kinds of environmental uh, conditions that are not beautiful and, and well controlled like in a data center. So it's kind of this whole next generation of speed, reliability, and, and, and kind of reach. It, it is. And, and actually, we, we develop test equipment for IoT devices. So for example, um, you know, we have a whole RF IoT cap test chamber that lets you bring in whatever IoT device you're using of any sort and, and really test it under hardened conditions to make sure it operates. Uh, this is particularly important, you know, not just in the industrial side, but in hospitals, for example, right. you name it. And then the other aspect with IoT is, um, is you know, and this is something people don't always think about, is who the heck is actually programming or building that IoT device? And how good are they at understanding all the security risks or not? Uh, I mean, who, you know, people don't think about this when they install a, an IoT device of some sort of what it actually uh, could enable a hacker to do in terms of getting into that device and, and accessing all kinds of information about you right. or based on that, finding out additional information. You know, like a, a lot of times people have all these networks, whether it's the watches, the Fitbits, et cetera. I mean, you don't know what actually went into that software. There's this assumption that, yeah, yeah, it's all safe. Somebody's taking care of it, but you just don't know. And, you know, like you could so easily see an evolution where, where you know, folks who are not so decent and nice would create networks that know, okay, this person is not at his house at this point. Activate the thieves to go in and, right. you know, like uh, break and enter of some sort. So I think the whole uh, IoT, it's wonderful. It's innovative, but I think people need to step back and also uh, question, has it really been fully tested? Is it truly as secure as we think it is? Is it creating a new opportunity for somebody to get in and get additional information about us that we didn't expect to be exposed? And I think those are questions that uh, a lot of people uh, just get so excited by the concept of it and don't do that due diligence. Right. And then there's a whole bunch of social issues that, that come up as well that I think are not very well addressed, my favorite being insurance. Just the whole model of insurance right. is based on aggregated risk pool that everybody pays into, and then it pays out the poor, unfortunate people that have bad things happen to them. But when you can segment to one, 
when when people know exactly my behavior based on where my phone goes, how fast it moves, right. how much time it spends on the couch, how much time uh, it's running down to Mickey D's, you know, what happens to the whole aggregated Privacy risk? Privacy and model, aggregated right? risk, exactly. Sure, the guy that runs 20 miles a day, he's gonna have cheap rates, but what about the person that doesn't? And I think there's a whole bunch of of social issues that come into you know all of this data centric world in which we're which we're it is I, I I think it's really exciting I mean that's what I love about technology is it's always shifting it's changing the issues that we face change dramatically with that uh, you know you talked about the social issues of insurance I mean heck you know there's the social issues of just even social media these days and in terms of how you you update and what you communicate and 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 how people are using that to to actually almost do corporate espionage on each other other. It's just, uh, you know, it, 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 it just, each technology shift brings with it a, I'll call it a social shift or a cultural shift right. that has to be addressed. Well, Marie, we could go on forever and ever. Unfortunately, we, uh, we are out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. Thanks uh, for taking a few minutes out of your day and stopping by. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We are in the studio in Palo Alto. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.